Welcome to another Supernatural Scotland, the podcast. Thanks for joining us again. I'm your host, Mark Smith. A huge welcome to my listeners from Belgium, America, and closer to home in England. I really do appreciate my Scottish listeners as well. You all know who you are, and with your support, I will carry on creating this podcast. I wanted to make a podcast that was less people having a conversation and more like scary stories by the campfire. I hope I am providing a fun and scary experience for all you listeners. Welcome to everyone else listening for the first time. I always love to see new listeners hailing from other countries. Again, thanks for joining us for another episode full of dread, gruesome stories and terror. Scotland has had its share of interesting and terrifying characters, some of them murderers, some of them devil worshippers, some of them witches, and some of them cannibals. Our first location today is Sonny Bean's Cave. The cave is located between Ballantrae and Girvan, on the west coast of Scotland. You can walk to it, but it's pretty difficult as you have to climb down rocks to get to the cave. And I have to mention how eerie a place it is with a heavy atmosphere of dread, even at such a beautiful spot of beach. After hearing the bloody story, I would not be surprised if it and the surrounding areas were haunted. Now for the legend of Sonny Bean. It really is bloody and gruesome, so get settled in for a terrifying story. Some say he is a myth, others claim he existed and it's all true. They say it actually happened in the 15th or 16th century. Alexander Sonny Bean is his full name, and he was believed to be a cannibal and a head of his family clan. Depending on where you research Sonny Bean, it depends on how many family members the clan had in total. It's safe to say it was around 40s to 50s. These numbers were so large due to the incestuous breeding. The family shamelessly continued this act to grow its numbers while somehow remaining secret to its closest neighbours. Sonny Bean came from humble beginnings. It is claimed he ran away from his ditch digger father when he realised he could not or did not want to follow in his father's footsteps. This quite possibly could have been put in his head by his dark and quite evil girlfriend. Or maybe he was always a dark soul in his own right, and he just met his soulmate. When he ran away after some robbery and possible murder, he discovered the cave which became his lair with his runaway partner, Black Agnes Douglas, who was believed to already be a vicious and nasty woman, and quite possibly a witch. It is with his female companion that this dark tale started. It is not known what attracted them to the cave, but they seemed to have a clear vision of what they wanted in life. The cave was large enough to call home, and the entrance would be blocked by the sea during high tide, making it a perfect hideaway for two psychopaths. I would describe them as pure evil. They lived in the cave for more than 25 years without anyone discovering it. Well, anyone that survived to tell the tale, everyone else became barbecue. They never wished to do honest work, and so together, as a psychotic perfect pair, they went to work robbing and murdering travellers. 
They were smart about it and avoided large groups or people they felt could fight back hard enough to put an end to the practice. As cannibals, they had the perfect setup, murder and rob, but also food supply for free. They would take the bodies back to the cave and cut them up to be eaten by the many family members who were growing in numbers all the time. This reminds me of the horror film Wrong Turn. And like in Wrong Turn, they would pickle leftovers for later. Maybe a wee midnight snack. It really was a perfect setup for them. New clothes and any items the travellers had on them while feeding themselves for free and basically getting rid of the evidence. Some body parts would wash up on shore and were put down to animal attacks. It is claimed the evil clan could have killed up to 1,000 people during their horrendous reign of terror. Can you imagine a thousand people in olden times disappearing when we had much lower levels of people, especially in Scotland with all the battles keeping our numbers lower. It certainly would be noticed much sooner in our times with the technology we have. Back then travellers could be from anywhere all over the world so no one would know they went missing in this specific area. The locals did eventually start noticing disappearances and investigations of the local area were completed. The cave was not investigated as no one believed anyone could survive in it. Little did they know a whole clan of cannibals were living there waiting for their next meal. A few locals and travellers were blamed for the disappearances and some were hung. It was a dangerous time if someone disliked you as they could blame you and as little as this would have caused you to be under scrutiny and possibly executed. Obviously this did not put an end to the large amount of people going missing. Eventually the clan picked up Eventually the clan picked on the wrong travellers. A man was skilled in combat and was carrying weapons ready to defend himself. He fought back with force against the untrained and vicious clan who probably had too much confidence with their many successful murders. The loud noise caused by the fighting attracted locals. However, it is said this was too late for the wife of the traveller who was pulled off her horse and mutilated there and then. A gruesome end indeed. Can you imagine riding your horse, going about your own business when all of a sudden a gruesome inbred group of wild people grabbed you and tried to rip you apart? Well, the traveller seen this horrific act and knew if he did not continue to fight, he would be next. He was saved by the locals who came to see what all the noise was. After a small battle, the clan retreated back to the cave. Now discovered, it was not long until the knowledge of the clan reached the king. A large group of men, along with some bloodhounds, tracked them to the cave. Upon the horrific discovery of the body parts and many skeletons and bones covering the floor of the cave, the men fought with the Bean Clan. Before arresting all of them, and taking them to the Tollbooth Jail in Edinburgh. Soon after, they were sentenced to death without trial, as they believed that inbred wild men and women did not deserve a trial, as the evidence was undeniable, and being inbred, they looked less than human. The stories differ here, but basically, the men had their arms and legs chopped off with possibly their manhood, which were thrown into fires while they were left to bleed to death. The evil women and children watched on in horror. The Bean Clan were now being treated to their own medicine and seen the horrors the legal system produced. 
After this, the women and children were tied to stakes and burned alive as witches. And that was the end of the Bean Clan. Our second location is the Tron Theatre in Glasgow. The building has been used as a theatre since 1981. It was used for a few other purposes in the years before. It was originally St Mary's Church which is claimed to have burned down in the late 1700s by a drunk member of the Hill Fire Club. You can still see the church's steeple which survived the fire. The building over many years has been used as a lot of things including executions and as a police station. As you would imagine it has likely seen many deaths and a lot of violence. One of the ghosts not seen but encountered is a seat tipper. An invisible being would tip the seats in the theatre and this was seen by a staff member. She decided to see if the claims were true and sat waiting for the seats to start tipping. They did not until she decided to read a book. As soon as she started to read the book, she could hear seats tipping nearby. Ghost children and a man dressed in full riding gear have also been seen over the years. They say a dark and evil spirit haunts the boiler room. The boiler room was built on the church's crypt. Who knows what dark spirits were released when the church went up in flames. Others have claimed to feel icy fingers on their neck or a door handle opening on its own. The back rows of the auditorium are claimed to be of high activity with a young girl, a town crier and others being spotted. Staff have also reported cold spots, large doors opening on their own and hearing footsteps. Back in the early 1900s, a famous illusionist was completing a show when a lamp fell from above, causing a fire to spread. Eleven people died in the fire, including the illusionist, who was found under a trap door, dead. It is also claimed the illusionist now haunts the theatre after his tragic end. Now for our creature feature. The first creature of the podcast is a Nukula V. It is a mythical sea creature which terrorises the northern isles of Scotland. It transforms into a part horse, part man when on land might sound silly, but is one of the nastiest demons of all Scottish folklore. What makes it so freaky is the fact it has no skin. Black blood flows through its yellow veins. It has a man's torso which joins the horse's back, and its long arms can reach the ground. Its head is very large, with a wide open mouth and a large single red flaming eye. Sounds to me like a nightmare. The Nukula V is blamed for sick livestock, diseased crops, droughts and sickness. It could also be blamed for epidemics. These can be caused by as little as a breath from the Nukula V. This evil creature would spend most of its time on land near the beach. 
it is said it cannot withstand fresh water. So if you are being chased by one, it's a good idea to jump in. It would also not come ashore if it was raining. It is believed the Nukla V is kept under control by the Orcadian spirit mother of the sea during the summer months. So enjoy your summer, you never know what awaits beyond. Our second creature is the big grey man of Ben McDewey. The grey man is a huge creature which stalks the summit and passes of Ben McDewey, which is the highest peak of the Cairn Gorms. The Cairn Gorms are surrounded by the largest national park in the UK. It is claimed the big grey man is around 10 feet tall and thin with long limbs and dark hair. It resembles a yeti. A lot like the yeti or Bigfoot, there have been very little sightings of the big grey man over the years. This is put down to him hiding in the fog on the mountain and it's believed he moves with the fog to keep out of sight. An experience with the creature was recorded by a visiting professor of organic chemistry at the University College of London. This was Professor John Norman Colley, best known for the first ever medical X-ray photograph. During a general meeting of the Cairngorms Club in 1925, he claimed during a visit to the summit of Ben McDo in 1891, he heard a large creature following him. This creature managed to stay hidden while stalking the professor, although he could hear the crunches of leaves and twigs behind him. It followed him for some time before it stopped and the professor confessed he would not return to the summit after his frightful experience. Other hikers then came forward with similar experiences at the summit and surrounding area. In 1945, a rescue worker was working in the Cairn Gorms. He reported hearing peculiar noises and a mist moving towards him. It frightened him so much, he fled the area before he could come face to face with whatever was in the mist. Another report was made of a hiker camping on Ben McDowey, and he felt a feeling of dread. When he looked outside, he seen a huge shadow in front of the moon. A mountaineer published an article in 1958 telling of his experience with the creature in 1943. He had spent 10 days climbing alone in the mountains. The atmosphere became dark and oppressive. A strong wind blew through the boulders and he could hear a strange echo in the mist. This was followed by loud footsteps. A huge strange shape charged at him. He pulled out his revolver and fired three times. This did not stop the creature and so he turned and ran for his life. So if you are visiting the Cairn Gorms, keep your eyes peeled for a mist forming and moving. Listen out for the crunching leaves and twigs, and of course for the loud footsteps as a big grey man might be stalking you. Oh, and you may wish to be careful where you set up camp. That is the end of the podcast. Thank you for your continued support. Goodbye.